Father, we pray today for your presence in our lives. Through your Holy Spirit and the merits of Jesus Christ, we thank you for hearing our prayers. Surround us now with your holy angels. Give us insight and wisdom. Bless us as we come to worship and acknowledge the God of heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's praise the Lord in song. 612, Onward Christian Soldiers. the Lord with our tithes and our offerings. This Sabbath, the loose offering that's collected will be given to conference advance. One of my favorite things to do to clear my mind and connect with God is to go on and outside and run. Whether it is a sunny or even on a cold day, running has been a great way to reset my thinking. Running constantly, consistently, has been shown to improve memory, increase overall health, and provide people with better moods and more energy. When I used to run on the track team, our coach always emphasized focusing on the race ahead of us, not what is happening to the right or to the left. There are many things happening in our world today, and if we focus on all the turmoil, it can become very discouraging. Yet God encourages with these words, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Together, we can run this race together 
And one way to support one another is by giving to the local conference advance. Did you know that your conference advance goes to support ministries that serve our region and touch people's lives? One example of this is our summer camp, which is a place where many young people serve God and work together to bring other young people to Christ through music, games, and activities. As we give today, let us give with an open heart. Deacons, come forward. Father, we thank you for your blessings, and we thank you for your love and mercy, and we ask a blessing on our conference and our leaders, Lord. Pray a special blessing for our Indiana camp. Ask that you would bless them, bless the people that work there, bless those who will be coming to meet Jesus. This we thanks, thanks, and give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Good morning, happy Sabbath. It's a blessing to be in the house of the Lord on the Sabbath day. We have a number of prayer requests here, and anyhow, it's always a praise to the Lord that we can be here. You know, our next, just go through a few announcements here. We're going to be passing out the, the Eclipse version. It's not a change of the the context is a change of the cover, but of the great controversies today after potluck, also next Sabbath, and then the following Sabbath. Um, and on Tuesday, only Tuesday this week at 5.30, we will also be uh, putting more of those in bags. We got about uh, 700, 750, something like that done last Tuesday, and um, maybe we'll get most of those out today. Anyhow. We have that opportunity. And just a, a side note, our Sabbath school lesson next quarter, you want to guess what the title of it is? The Great Controversy. Yeah, I, the lessons are back here, and I see them whenever I'm making copies. I hope I read that right. If not, we should study the Great Controversy. Anyhow, the Great Controversy between Christ and Satan is an issue that is in the Bible from the book of Genesis all the way to Revelation, and when you read the end of the book, God wins. Anyhow, we have that opportunity after fellowship meal today to go out and pass out books here in our community and in the coming weeks in other communities also. So we, uh, anybody's willing to help, and I did send messages out. Some people I know can't get out and walk so much because of what we're handing out is not just a little card, a little pamphlet. It's okay to have drivers that are there restocking us with books for those who be going door to door. So there's that opportunity. We will have our historicals of prophecies again on Monday night at 7 and Zoom prayer meeting at 7. There will be no meeting at the high rise this week coming up. All righty. Prayer requests, a number of them. One is reaching the community through the eclipse and the opportunity we have to catch people's attention. Um, 
for our families that don't have the assurance of salvation. And then there was also a silent request there. Uh, Danny and Celeste. Danny yesterday was having chest pain and pressure, some pain in his arms, and wisely, due to his history, they went into Terre Haute. They didn't find anything wrong. We praise the Lord for that. They kept him overnight. I think they were going to possibly do a change in his medication or something. Uh, they're hoping to be able to come back today. I want you to pray for my brother, Tim. He had back surgery here, oh, I'm going to say about four or five months ago. Uh, October, okay. Sherry keeps track of this. That's about four or five months ago. Anyhow, he had back surgery, and he is still dealing with a lot of pain and this week, having seen the back surgeon, for some reason, he says there isn't anything else they can do, which, uh, anyhow, keep my brother Tim in prayer in that situation. And for Sherry and I, we're going to be traveling. We're going to be going to Seattle this next week through the weekend to see my sister and to bring mom back home. So just ask for safety in the travels. All righty, Ron's getting uh, another shot in the back, and so keep that in our prayers. Sophie for health, Diane for health, uh, Jeff with a weak heart, Karina for health, and also praying for good results for Lylin's ultrasound. All righty, I know there's probably silent requests that we want to say. Yes, Freddie? Mm-hmm. Amen. We'll continue to lift him up in prayer. Anyhow, again, I know there's those silent requests, whether it be for family or whatever the situation may be. The Lord knows and hears those. We will go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity, again, to be in your house, for the fact that we woke up this morning and were able to put our feet on the floor. We thank you, Lord, for Jesus and for the great price that was paid, not only for our salvation, but, Lord, for that of our families and for the whole world. Lord, we put before you our family members, our children, our grandchildren, maybe siblings who have gone astray. We ask, Lord, that you would continue to work on their hearts, calling them back to, to your house, to a relationship with you. Lord, we pray for, for guests that have come and then haven't returned. We just pray that the seed planted in those hearts would bring forth for your name's sake. And Lord, as we have this opportunity to go out and, and put the great controversy into the hands of people, to give an invitation to people to know you and to know what's about to come upon this earth, we do it, Lord, with humility and asking, Lord, for your blessing. Because without that, our, our efforts are just vain. Pray, Lord, that you would be with those who have been studying in the Bible school, those who have been watching the videos, that your spirit would continue to work on those hearts also. Lord, we've heard the prayer request for those who are sick. Lord, for those missing members, be with Danny and Celeste today in a special way that they will know that you love and care for them as well as their church family. Be with those who have become discouraged and turned away that they would return. Lord, the silent request, you know each one. You know those who are hurting, those who are having struggles. 
we ask, Lord, for your intervention in each situation to your honor and glory and for the salvation of souls. Bless now this service today that all will be to your honor and glory and that our activities today will bring honor and glory to you and that we will each be in your kingdom is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture this morning is found in the book of Proverbs, chapter 11, and verse 14. Proverbs 11, verse 14, this is from the New King James Version. Where there is no counsel, the people fall, but in the multitude of counselors there is safety. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. Good morning, friends. And, you know, we, we sang the Onward Christian Soldiers. We're about ready to go out and put some books out. So I'm looking at the urgency of the moment, and that's why I entitled this uh, in that fashion. One thing about it is that we need leaders today. And guess who are leaders? All of you are really leaders. And leadership actually begins in the home. And I'll explain a little bit of what I mean by that. But sometimes I think that we feel that we have all the time in the world to do the things that we need to do or to do what God has impressed us to do, to do what's right. We have all the time in the world. Well, this week, we, our three-and-a-half-year-old Mastiff had a twisted belly and died. We thought we had all the time in the world to pet her, to, be, to, to enjoy her presence. We don't know what's going to happen. But we do know this. While we're here, we need to make a difference. Amen? We need to make a difference. And so this church, our church, needs leadership. And it comes from both angles, men and women. Even though it, it, you look in the scripture, the man's role seems to be a little higher in leadership, and I'll cover that here in just a little bit. But I want to look at a couple of women leaders to start with. Miriam, she was the first woman in the history of Christianity to be a prophetess. She's found in both the Talmud, which is the code of the Jewish law, and the Torah, meaning instructions, the first five books of the Bible. And you can find her in Exodus chapter 15 and verse 20. This one really is something here, Deborah. She was a pop prophetess. Besides Samuel, she is the only other person referred to as both a prophet and a judge. She was an exceptional military leader. Can you think of any other woman in history that was an exceptional military leader? I can't. Maybe you can tell me afterwards who it might be. But this is incredible, the role that, the, that uh, these two women are, have played. And we'll talk a little bit more about, about another lady here, another woman. Because many, how many you see today for women have led a nation into battle? How many women have led an army into war? Women have played major roles, especially in their families, but rarely on a national level. I can think of Esther, a libertarian. She actually brought, she, she actually brought um, 
salvation through Christ to the whole nation. That's powerful. Then you look at some of the men. Well, we look at Abraham. And unfortunately, he doesn't always tell you the females. But Abraham begot Isaac, and Isaac begot Jacob. <clears throat> and then Jacob begot his 12 sons. His 12 sons became the 12 tribes of, of, uh, of Israel. All the priests were male. All the prophets that wrote books in this in this uh, Bible were men. Even the minor prophets were written by men. I think it's important that we realize our role as men because women have, I feel, never let down from, from their leadership. I think men have let it down, not women. So I want, you to I want to share something with you today. I'm going to look at some backgrounds here and see if you can relate to any of these. First background is being raised by your biological parents. Now, I don't want to see a show of hands, but would you say that that's one of the most positive that could happen, that being raised by your biological parents? Well, now, it's positive only if we, 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 it's, it's a Christian home or, or a Christian setting then it's positive. And were they loving parents? Did they support and provide for their children? Food, clothing, attention. Because I want you to know that neglect is a form of abuse. And then they don't feel accepted if they're neglected. And that leads to them joining into gangs. And I don't have to prove that to you. All we have to do is just look at the streets today. Look at the missing, missing individuals. And so another, another uh, background, background two, says this. Background number two is comes a, a, a split family, a divorce, stepfather, stepmother. That's where I came from. I had four parents, my biological and my step-parents. And what's really unfortunate today is that the percentage of the divorce rate is almost the same in the church as it is in the world. Not quite, but it's close. Background number three are single parents. The mother has double duty. In fact, it can also be the father because... In my family, we're experiencing, we have experienced that just recently. But the mother has double duty. I'll just stick with her. Let me tell you something. It's impossible for the mother to be the mother and the father. It's impossible. And usually there's no male figure in the home. If so, they're living together or he's like a big brother or a mentor, which can be good or bad. But today, society has placed individuals that are, are single together like they're married because of money. That comes from our government, by the way. And this is not a bashing of the government. And then the last one I want you to, to realize or to see is the background. Foster care and, abdo and uh, adoption. Those in foster care are waiting to be adopted. They may have lived in two or three homes already, but they're waiting to be adopted, to actually have a, have a parent. They may never have known their biological parents. They could have been killed in an automobile accident. The parents maybe died of some sort of disease. Maybe the baby wasn't wanted by either parents, and so off it goes. I know this happens. So they're waiting for a home. Did you know that Indiana has some 15,000 children waiting to be adopted or placed in foster care? They are waiting for a home. In fact, 7 million children are referred to the CPS each year, Child Protective Service. 
seven million. <clears throat> and on any given day, 400,000 children are in foster homes. They're all waiting for a home. And so the key that we need to see here is that these little ones that may be at, at birth, given to someone else, maybe at three years old, five years old, 10 years old, 15 years old, 18 years old, they all grow up and they become young adults, then they become adults, and then they become like me, an old adult. Now, some of you are older than me and that makes me feel good, but that's okay. They, this is what we're dealing with in our society is individuals who have come out of these circumstances. And, and so if you bring up a father to them, many times they, they, they kind of let down, um, they, they shut down, they, they, they don't understand because they've never experienced a father here on earth. It hasn't been firsthand for them. Well, so what do we do? I mean, we need to realize what we're up against, a society that's hurting, children that are hurting, young adults that are hurting, men and women who are hurting. That's why we need leadership in the church, that very reason, because we have Christ. We have this home in heaven, and we need to bring that to all of these individuals, all these all the ones that have been raised either by their biological parents and it was negative and on and on. This is what we're dealing with. And we have a huge role, especially mothers. I want you to see this. I shouldn't say especially mothers, but mothers too. I want you to see in 2 Timothy, for just a moment, 2 Timothy chapter, chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. This is Paul speaking to Timothy. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, I am persuaded is in you also. See the mother's role, how important it is? Because catch this in chapter 3 of the same book, 2 Timothy 3, verse 15. And, from, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And then it goes on to talk about all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, that is belief, for reproof which is conviction for, for correction, which is a change in your lives, and instruction, which means we're being trained. They need to be trained. We need to be trained. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Everyone plays a role. Now, I've talked about that before. You know, I have to admit something today. I've always thought that I was a good, a good father. So how many here think you're a good father? I'm going to raise my hand. I thought I was a good father. <laughs> you're all being safe, aren't you? That's all right. I get it. Well, <clears throat> this was before I became a Christian Seventh-day Adventist, because there are Seventh-day Adventists that really aren't Christian. What a surprise. I'm sure you, you knew that. So what I did is when I became a Seventh-day Adventist, I was now feeling like not only was I a good father, but now I really have it all under control. I really have it all figured out. So one day I asked my son, do you obey me because you love me or because you are afraid of me? And I was not prepared for the answer. He was afraid of me, which broke my heart. What I discovered was something very, very important. 
because I'm a representative of Jesus Christ. I am an ambassador of the king. And according to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, it says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. But if my son is afraid of me, why would he ever come to me? And so what I really discovered at that point is the way that I look at me isn't the way others do. And guess what? It's the same with you. You may put yourself up here, which like I did as a parent, but I ended up finding that myself was really down here. Everyone looks at you differently than what you think. You have your own opinion of yourself. And so do other people. And it's many times not the same. And so... Whether it's family, whether it's church, some form of relative, community, workplace, people are looking at you and people are sizing you up and they have an opinion of you. You know, it really hurts to, to know that you've hurt somebody. And especially, it hurts when you know you've hurt somebody you love. <clears throat> and I, I think about Christ on the cross, someone that I, I love. And when I look at Christ on the cross, I see the fingerprints of the hammer on that hammer. It's my fingerprints on that hammer. It's me that helped drive the nails through the feet and hands of Jesus Christ. And there hangs Christ on the cross and God revealing that he really is love. 1 Corinthians 13 <clears throat> lets us know that love never fails. So we need to guide our youth. And, and, and I should have just said we need to guide everybody the best we can. Catch this. Jesus said to her, and that's Mary, this is after he's resurrected. Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but to go to my brethren. There is a family word, brethren, and also father is a family word. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. It's a family circumstance. It's a family. God wants a family. He has to have a family, you see, because if he doesn't, there's a problem by, them, by, by James saying that, or it's John that says that, that Jesus, or that God is love. That, that's, you have to have someone to love in order to understand love. And so what we find here is that Jesus is revealing the importance of a family. John, John 14, verse 1 says, uh, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, my Father, your Father, my God, your God. Or how about this one in Matthew chapter 6, beginning with verse 9? The disciples are saying, You know, Lord, teach us how to pray. And the first two words that come out of his mouth is, our Father. Vitally important for us to cling to that. So when we look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, let's look at this for just a minute. But the fruits of the Spirit is. And now the fruit of the Spirit. Say it with me. The fruit of the Spirit. It is not plural. And I've talked about this before, and sometimes I repeat myself, and I don't apologize for that. The first, is, the first three is love, joy, and peace. The next, long-suffering, kindness, and goodness. And this comes from the new King James, so it's not going to be exactly uh, the, like the King James. Then you have faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, I want you to know that if you have love, then all of these other, other uh, fruit, all this other package of fruit falls in together. 
And you can say you have love and joy and peace and long-suffering and kindness, but if you don't have self-control, then you're not going to have anybody believe that you have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, and gentleness, and goodness, and faithfulness. It's all about self-control. It starts with love. It ends with self-control. They go together. These are the attributes of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You know, God, the Father, is family-oriented. We're looking at heaven bound. It was God's purpose to repopulate heaven. He's family oriented. It's God, it was God's purpose to repopulate heaven with the human family. Who, who does that represent? Us. If they would show themselves obedient to his every word. First Bible commentary, page 1082. So, so those who are going to be saved from this world are going to take the place of the lost angels, according to Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9, the ones that were cast out. A third of the angels were cast out. So we look at this, and you've got to wonder, how do we lead? Well, you know, I mentioned here a minute ago that, that in 1 John 4, 8, God states that, that uh, it stated that God is love, and I believe that sincerely. He, how could he claim to be love with no one to love, and it's impossible for that to happen? He wants family. In fact, Jesus makes this point when Jesus stated how to be baptized. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And so family has begun a long time ago. In fact, Revelation 5 verse 11 says with the angels, there's 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands and thousands of angels. It's part of God's family, part of the heavenly hosts. In Job chapter 1, we find that, that the sons of God are coming to meet with, with the Lord God. And so does Satan come and meet. And, and the Lord says, who are you? And well, I'm, I'm Satan. I'm the one who walks to and fro on, on the earth. He's saying, I, I, the earth is mine. And so the others that are there happen to be representatives of other worlds that were created. And you can find that in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, where it says that Jesus created the worlds. There's two institutions that came out of the Garden of Eden. The Sabbath and marriage. Exactly right. Which two do you, which, which, well, let me, let me ask it in a different way. Do you think that the devil is attacking those two institutions more than anything else? Absolutely, he's right. Sabbath and marriage. <clears throat> the Sabbath sanctifies us, and then marriage is a holy matrimony. <clears throat> it's ordained by God to become one, one in, in purpose, one in direction. And so when God says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, let us make man in our image. He's starting to create a family on earth. He's looking at Adam and Eve and saying, and saying, you know, be fruitful and multiply. Fruitful means to make, to grow, to increase, to reproduce. Create a family. That's what I want is more family. And then in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, it talks about being fruitful. But when you look at the creation in Genesis 1, 26, us and our are plural words, which they mean company or group. In other words, more than two. You can say there's a pair, but this is a company or a group, more than two. And so the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost that's why Jesus made the point of how to be baptized. 
So how do we lead? How do we lead people to the truth? Well, let's look at it being an example, showing our confidence in God. How about our lifestyles? Obedience and loyalty to God. Faith and trust in God. Relying upon God. Teaching and counseling truths of God. And, you know, earlier it made the point, I made the point that, that God is, is actually using the human family to, to repopulate. But, but with that in mind, I want to back up to that for just a minute. If they would show themselves obedient to some of his word, every word. And so this helps us to understand why many are called but few are chosen because they're not keeping, they're not obedient to his every word. All right. So we need to be teaching and counseling truths of God because where there is no counsel, the people fall. This is our scripture reading today in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 14. But in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. You know, Sister White makes the same comment. There's wisdom in a multitude of, counsel, of counseling. We need to grasp a hold of that. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18. So, I want to jump to Ephesians chapter 5, if you could please. Ephesians chapter 5, I want you to see something here. Because remember, when I started off, I said leadership starts where? In the home? I heard somebody say that. You were listening. Good. Leadership begins in the home. And I want to share something with you here. Verse 22. Ephesians 5, 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, and also Christ is head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. There it is, guys. You rule. No, I'm sorry, but that's not really what that means at all. Sorry to disappoint you if that's how you take it. This is the kind of submission that can only be given between two equals. God took the rib out of Adam. Eve stands by his side. No one is greater than the other. They each play a role. And so, this kind of submission that can only be given between two equals. It's a voluntary submission. She is accepting an inferior position or condition out of respect to her husband. And this is why she does it, understanding that every community must have a head. True or false? True. I mean, how many, how many pastors do we have? One. I mean, at least in this church. <laughs> Some churches have more. How many head elders do we have? One. How many head deacons do we have? One. How many mayors does this city have? None. Well, that's their fault. <laughs> There's supposed to be one. And how many presidents do we have? One too many. I mean, one. Okay? That's the key. And so the, the wife realizes the need of someone being the head. And for two purposes, of organization and for the purpose of existence. You see, a house divided is going to fall. And so it's vitally important. And so she is submitting on her own will because of the love that she has for her husband. And we have a tremendous responsibility yet that's out there. And we can reach countless people yet. And so we need to start leadership right in the home. Look at verse 24. There, 
Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. What, is that, what does that mean, subject? Well, you know, subject does mean obedient. But if you look at it, even in the Greek, it's talking about falling in with. And so she's agreeing with what's happening, and she's falling in with the idea that he is the spiritual leader. He is the stronger of the one that's going to protect the family. He's the one that's usually going to bring in enough to, to supply for the family. And so when you look at this, I wonder, I, I put on some characteristics here. Catch this first, though. Her relationship to her husband is a reflection or illustration of her relationship to Christ. Because isn't that used in verse 23? Husbands, husband is the head of the wife. Christ is the head of the church. Therefore, in verse 24, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So what are the characteristics of the subjection of the church to Christ? Willingness to follow Christ. Confidence in following Christ. Now, I want, I want to stop here for just a minute. Because, ladies, when, you are, when you're honoring your husbands and submitting to them, only because that's what you want to do because you love them, this also represents the husband to the wife or the wife to the husband. The wife... Willingness to follow her husband. The wife, confidence in following her husband. It's the same with the church as it is with the family. The wife has faith and trust in her husband just as the church has faith and trust in Christ. I have heard this comment so many times, it just annoys me. Husbands say, I get no respect. Well, let me tell you something. You might not deserve respect. Men and women are designed differently, right? They are designed differently. Women want what? Unconditional love. Men want unconditional respect. That's quite a thought. Husbands can be bitter and crude and unloving to their wives. Uh, verse 25 says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. And if you turn into Colossians chapter 3, I want to I focus on, on, on what Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 18. Wives, submit to your own husbands as it is fitting in the Lord. Well, I mean, he's clarified that in the book of Ephesians. Husbands, Love your wives and do not be, what? Bitter toward them. You know, when you're bitter toward your wife, they're not receiving the unconditional love. When they don't receive the unconditional love, guess what? You're not going to get unconditional respect. It's not going to happen. Then it goes on again. And husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. This is big. You see, the father's role is huge. And that's why we have so much problem out there today is because there's not many fathers within the home. In his book, Love and Respect, Dr. Emerson Egrich's quotes and responses from men he has counseled. Here's the question. Which would you prefer? Now, this is for the men. To be left alone and unloved in the world? To feel inadequate and disrespected by everyone? Now, you don't have to answer that, but I'll tell you, my first thought was to be left alone and unloved in the world. I want to be alone. Leave me alone. If there's not going to be any respect, I, I, I want out. 
So let's just see what kind of response he got. This is what they said. I would rather live with a wife who respected me but did not love me than to live with a wife who loves me and does not respect me. You see, we're designed differently. That's just all the way, that's just, just the way it is. Men will take a bullet for a friend and die for their wives because we're looking for honor and respect. I've never heard yet of a wife jumping out and taking the bullet for her husband. Have you? No, it's a respectful, honorable position. Even when you go into the military, and, you know, praise the Lord for the females that are in the military. But men, are, want, are they're wanting respect. They're wanting honor. And women are wanting love. So it's all about love and respect. In fact, respect is the key to motivating a husband. If you want to motivate your husband, ladies, shoot him some respect. Now, if he doesn't deserve it, maybe he'll figure it out. Because if you are showing unconditional love to your, to your wife, you're going to get unconditional respect. Women want to be loved. She wants to be cherished as a princess. She longs to be first in importance to him. Many of us might believe or say, I'm already doing that. Hey, I'm, I'm doing all that. I'm covering all the bases. Why isn't she respecting me? Why do we argue all the time? Well, that's a good question. I want you to see something in Matthew chapter 19. And I want to begin with verse 16. Matthew 19, 16. I know it says 17 on there. That's the Lord's words. Here we go. This is the rich young ruler. Oh, come on, pastor. That's been preached so many times. How can you continue to preach over the same thing? Well, maybe there's just a little tiny more of an, of an avenue that I can share with you today. Now behold, one came and said to him, good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And Jesus says, well, why do you call me good? There's only one that's good, and that's God. But if you want to enter into life, what are the next three words? Keep his commandments. Okay? And so now he said to him, which ones? Which ones do I keep? You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said to him, all these things I've done. Hey, I'm doing it all. But Jesus wouldn't have brought it up if he didn't need counsel. He has trouble with humanity. This rich young ruler has trouble with people that he's dealt with, and he ends up with the money, and they end up without. And you can go back to every one of those that he dealt with, and I'll just about guarantee you that if they went back and with a study, that you would find that there wasn't a whole lot of good that they wanted to say about the rich young ruler. But he says, I've done all these things. I have kept them from my youth. What do I still lack? Well, Jesus is helping him to realize his weaknesses. And what he still lacks, it says here in verse 21, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. And he couldn't do it. He turned his back on the God of heaven. He turned his back on the Lord. But the point that I want to make here today is he had this problem with humanity, and usually the only reason why we have problems with humanity with the last six commandments is because we have a problem with God in the first four. That leads to the problem with humanity. And he felt that he was doing everything that he possibly can do. And so he's looking at himself in a different light. I've done all that. I've done all that. I'm doing that. 
But that's not how Christ was looking at him. That's not how the public was looking at him. They're looking at him through a different lens. He's looking at himself one way, just like you do. And God and other people are looking at him in a different way. We need to analyze ourselves. We need to examine ourselves. There is an urgency of the moment to get past self and focus on the world around us. True or false? It is true to get past self. This is my view of the results of true leadership. This is what it looks like to me. Someone that you have comforted, maybe brought to your home, maybe brought to the church. This is true leadership. And I want you to know that we need to have this urgency of the moment. Noah's last sermon was an altar call to come into the ark. It was an altar call. When David killed Goliath, it was the urgency of the moment. When Lot wouldn't leave the city of Sodom, the the angels had this urgency of the moment to grab him by the hand and pull him out. Nehemiah was on the wall building with his weapon right beside him. It was the urgency of the moment. I'm not leaving until I build this wall. And it goes on and on. And so my question today, friends, are you willing to take a bullet for someone that you love? Are you willing to die for someone that you love? And better yet, here's the hard part. Are you willing to live a life for Christ? That's the hardest part. Dying is easy. It may happen quickly, and you don't even know. But we need to lead this country, lead this city, lead our neighbors to the foot of the cross. You are leaders. And leadership is vital, and the leadership begins in the home. I remember, and I think I've told this story before, so bear with me. We were living in Iowa. We lived out on a gravel road. We were probably five or six miles from town, and there was a snowstorm coming in, and, you know, it was really on its way, and it was starting to snow, and the wind was blowing. And, And so... Uh, A friend of mine had stopped by, and they were afraid to go any further, so he and his wife and their children stayed at our house. And so I said to him, let's go in and get some groceries so that we know we have enough. Now, did we send the women to do that? No. Because of the honor and the respect that men want, we take it on ourselves to say, this is a man's job. Do it. So we went into town. Got the groceries. We got back to the last turn. Turn, and I'm probably a quarter of a mile from my house, maybe a half mile. And we go a little ways, and it was snowing so bad by then, and the wind was blowing so hard I couldn't see, and we went in the ditch. He gets out, and he takes his bags of groceries, and he runs. And I'm watching him run. It was 80 below zero with wind chill. That's pretty vicious. And it was snowing so hard that you couldn't see the road. So I grabbed my two bags of groceries, and if it wouldn't have been for this farmhouse that was on the north side of the road, the farmhouse, the trees, the buildings, which left a bare spot of snow and blocked the wind, I don't think I would have made it. Because when I got to the house, I knocked on the door because I couldn't open it. I think I actually knocked with my head. I was using my head that day. And so What happens is they open the door, and I fall into the house, and the groceries just roll. We'll do anything, won't we, guys, for respect? We'll do what it takes. The right things, by the way, not just anything. But the whole idea is that leadership begins at home. And that's 
what makes us who we are today. And the key I want you to remember is you might be thinking very highly of yourself, but how are other people thinking of yourself? Let's, let's really analyze and examine our lives. So let's turn to our closing hymn. Six fourteen. Yeah. Sound the battle cry. Six fourteen. I pray today that, ca- that Christ really is the captain of, of us. He is our Lord, our Savior. And so, Father, I just pray that you give us all strength and courage as we lead out in this, this lost, uh, dreary world. Help us to lead those that need to be led to the foot of the cross. Give us the, the insight and the wisdom and the understanding to lead as no other time before. It's time for us to step up and to stand up. And I thank you, Father, for giving us this insight, this wisdom, and understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.